Today, we're diving into the fourth and final sections of Kimberly Crenshaw's seminal article, Race, Reform, and Retrenchment, Transformation and Legitimation in Anti-Discrimination Law. This section unpacks the complex relationship between race consciousness, legal reforms, and the ideological frameworks that both empower and limit social change. First up, Crenshaw lays down the historical groundwork. She shows us how race consciousness has been historically manipulated to maintain social hierarchies, especially after the Reconstruction era. She argues that racism was often used as a tool to create a broader base for a new notion of democracy, even if it came at the expense of class solidarity. Moving on, she takes us into the labor movement, highlighting how race consciousness was a significant factor in the exclusion of black workers from unions. This exclusion served as a mechanism to maintain racial hierarchies within the labor force. Fast forward to the modern era, and Crenshaw cites Ronald Reagan's presidency as a pivotal moment where race consciousness played a significant role in shaping American politics. Now let's talk about the transition from the Jim Crow era to an era of formal equality and race law. While this transition dismantled explicit forms of discrimination, it didn't eliminate the underlying race consciousness that continues to function in more covert ways. Crenshaw then critically examines the dual role of rights discourse. While it has been instrumental in dismantling formal barriers, it's also contributed to an ideological framework that makes the current conditions facing the black underclass appear fair and reasonable. She also raises concerns about the potential loss of a collective identity among blacks due to the different experiences of racism that various classes of African Americans now face. Finally, Crenshaw argues for a pragmatic approach that acknowledges the dual role of rights and the dominant ideology. She suggests that African Americans must engage in what she calls a self-conscious ideological struggle to navigate the complexities of race consciousness and liberal reform. So, what are the key takeaways here? Crenshaw presents a nuanced view of the role of rights discourse. While it has been a tool for progress, it also serves to legitimize existing inequalities by framing them within a narrative of formal equality. Two, she argues that race consciousness is not just a relic of the past, but continues to play a complex role in modern society, often intertwined with class consciousness. Three, she calls for a strategic engagement with the dominant ideology, acknowledging that frontal attacks may not be effective given the deeply institutionalized nature of race consciousness. Lastly, despite the fragmentation of experiences within the black community, Crenshaw emphasizes the importance of collective action to challenge the deeply ingrained norms that perpetuate inequality. In the end, Crenshaw's work raises crucial questions about the efficacy of legal reforms and rights discourse in genuinely transforming racial hierarchies. It also challenges us to think strategically about how to navigate within a system inherently designed to maintain certain forms of inequality. Her call for a new approach that focuses on the specific needs of the African-American community serves as a rallying point for future discourse and action. Section 4. The Context Defined racist ideology, and hegemony. The failure of the critics to consider race in their account of law and legitimacy is not a minor oversight. Race consciousness is central, not only to the domination of blacks, but also to whites' acceptance of the legitimacy of hierarchy and to their identity with elite interests. Exposing the centrality of race consciousness is crucial to identifying and delegitimating beliefs that present hierarchy as inevitable and fair. Moreover, exposing the centrality of race consciousness shows how the options of blacks in American society have been limited and how the use of rights rhetoric has emancipated blacks from some manifestations of racial domination. A realignment of the critical project 
to incorporate race consciousness must begin with beliefs about blacks in American society and how these beliefs legitimize racial coercion. Thus, this part examines the deep-rooted problem of racist ideology, or white race consciousness, and suggests how this form of consciousness legitimates prevailing injustices and constrains the development of new solutions that benefit black Americans. Racist ideology provides a series of rationalizations that suppress the contradictions between American political ideals and black existence under white supremacy. Not only does racism legitimate the oppression of blacks, it also helps to define and privilege membership in the white community, creating a basis for identification with dominant interests. Racism serves a consensus-building hegemonic role by designating black people as separate, visible others to be contrasted in every way with all other social groups. Although not consenting to domination, black people are seen as legitimate objects of antipathy and coercion by whites. In the first section of this part, I examined the political and ideological dynamic of white supremacy, which I term the politics of otherness. In this part's second section, I sketch the contours of an analysis which suggests that race consciousness legitimates racial oppression. Within this framework, one can better comprehend how the assertion of rights in the context of a formal, legally sanctioned subordination created a radical challenge to the dominant order. In response to this assertion of rights, legal reforms were promulgated that transformed the black experience by lifting formal barriers that had subordinated all black people and produced their formal and political designation as other. The critics are correct in observing that, despite these gains, engaging in rights discourse has helped to de-radicalize and co-opt the challenge in the current period in which racial oppression continues to flourish behind the screen of racial equality. Yet, only after race ideology itself and the real differences that formal equality made in transforming race ideology are understood can the paradoxical relationship of transformation and legitimation be fully appreciated. Blacks are ultimately presented with a dilemma. Liberal reform both transforms and legitimates. Even though legal ideology absorbs, redefines, and limits the language of protest, African Americans cannot ignore the power of legal ideology to counter some of the most repressive aspects of racial domination. Subsection A, the hegemonic role of racism, establishing the other in American ideology. Throughout American history, the subordination of black types and beliefs that made their conditions appear logical and natural. Historically, white supremacy has been premised upon various political, scientific, and religious theories, each of which relies on racial characterizations and stereotypes about blacks that have coalesced into an extensive legitimating ideology. Today, it is probably not controversial to say that these stereotypes were developed primarily to rationalize the oppression of blacks. What is overlooked, however, is the extent to which these stereotypes serve a hegemonic function by perpetuating a mythology about both blacks and whites even today, reinforcing an illusion of a white community that cuts across ethnic, gender, and class lines. As presented by critical scholars, hegemonic rule succeeds to the extent that the ruling class worldview establishes the appearance of a unity of interest between the dominant class and the dominated. Throughout American history, racism has identified the interest of subordinated whites with those of society's white elite. Racism does not support the dominant order simply because all whites want to maintain their privilege at the expense of blacks or because blacks sometimes serve as convenient political scapegoats Instead, the very existence of a clearly subordinated other group is contrasted with the norm in a way that reinforces identification with the dominant group. Racism helps create an illusion of unity through the oppositional force of a symbolic other, 
The establishment of an other creates a bond, a burgeoning common identity of all non-stigmatized parties whose identity and interest are defined in opposition to the other. According to the philosophy of Jacques Derrida, a structure of polarized categories is characteristic of Western thought. Western thought has always been structured in terms of dichotomies or polarities, good versus evil, being versus nothingness, presence versus absence, truth versus error, identity versus difference, mind versus matter, man versus woman, soul versus body, life versus death, nature versus culture, speech versus writing. These polar opposites do not, however, stand as independent and equal entities. The second term in each undesirable version of the first, a fall away from it. In other words, the two terms are not simply opposed in their meanings, but are arranged in a hierarchical order, which gives the first term priority. Racist ideology replicates this pattern of arranging oppositional categories in a hierarchical order. Historically, whites represented the dominant antinomy, while blacks came to be seen as separate and subordinate. This hierarchy is reflected in the chart below. Note how each traditional negative image of blacks correlates with a counter image of whites. Reading of the chart, historical oppositional dualities. White images, black images. White image, industrious. Black image, lazy. White image, intelligent. Black image, unintelligent. White, moral, Black immoral, white knowledgeable, black ignorant, white enabling culture, black disabling culture, white law abiding, black criminal, white responsible, black shiftless, white virtuous, pious, black lascivious. The oppositional dynamic symbolized by this chart was created and maintained through an elaborate and systematic process. Laws and customs help create races out of a broad range of human traits. In the process of creating races, the categories came to be filled with meaning. Blacks were characterized one way, whites another. Whites became associated with normatively positive characteristics. Blacks became associated with the subordinate, even aberrational characteristics. The operation of this dynamic along with the important political role of racial oppositionalism, can be illustrated through a few brief historical references. Edmund Morgan provides vivid illustration of how slaveholders from the 17th century onward created and politicized racial categories to maintain the support of non-slaveholding whites. Morgan recounts how the planters lumped Indians, mulattoes, and Negroes in a single slave class, and how these categories became an essential, if unacknowledged, ingredient in the Republican ideology that enabled Virginians to lead the nation. Having accepted a common interest with slaveholders in keeping blacks subordinated, even whites who had material reasons to object to the dominance over the slaveholding class could challenge the regime only so far. The power of race consciousness convinced whites to support a system that was opposed to their own economic interests. As George Fredrickson puts it, racial privilege could and did serve as a compensation for class disadvantage. Domination through race consciousness continued throughout the post-Reconstruction period. Historian C. Van Woodward has argued that the ruling plantocracy was able to undermine the progressive accomplishments of the populist movement by stirring up anti-black sentiment among poor white farmers. Racism was articulated as the broader ground for a new democracy. As racism formed the new base for a broader notion of democracy, class differences were mediated through reference to a racial community of equality. A tragic example of the success of such race-conscious political manipulation is the career of Tom Watson, leader of the progressive populist movement of the 1890s. Watson, in his attempts to educate the masses of poor farmers about the destructive role of race-based politics, repeatedly told black and white audiences, 
You are made to hate each other because upon that hatred is rested the keystone of the arch of financial despotism, which enslaves you both. You are deceived and blinded that you may not see how this race antagonism perpetuates a monetary system which beggars you both. Yet, by 1906, Watson had joined the movement to disenfranchise blacks. According to Woodward, Watson had persuaded himself that only after the Negro was eliminated from politics could populist principles gain a hearing. In other words, the white men would have to unite before they could divide. White race consciousness also played a role in the nascent labor movement in the North. Labor historian Herbert Hill has demonstrated that unions of virtually all trades excluded black workers from their ranks, often entirely barring black employment in certain fields. Immigrant labor unions were particularly adamant about keeping out black workers. Indeed, it was for the precise purpose of assimilating into the American mainstream that immigrant laborers adopted these exclusionary policies. The political and ideological role that race consciousness continues to play is suggested by racial polarization in contemporary presidential politics. Several political commentators have suggested that many whites supported Ronald Reagan in the belief that he would correct a perceived policy imbalance that unjustly benefited blacks. And some argue further that Reagan made a direct racist appeal to white voters. Manning Marable notes, for example, that appeals to the race consciousness of white workers were the decisive factor in Reagan's 1984 victory, especially in the South. Reagan received nearly 70% of the white vote, whereas 90% of black voters cast their ballots for Mondale. Similarly, the vast majority of blacks, 82%, disapproved of Reagan's performance, whereas only 32% of whites did. Even the Democratic Party, which has traditionally relied upon blacks as its most loyal constituency, has responded to this apparent racial polarization by seeking to distance itself from black interests. Although it has been argued that the racial polarization demonstrated in the 1984 election does not represent a trend of white defactions from the Democratic Party, it is significant that, whatever the cause of the party's inability to attract white votes, Democratic leaders have expressed a willingness to moderate the party's stand on key racial issues in attempts to recapture the white vote. Subsection B, the role of race consciousness in a system of formal equality. The previous section emphasizes the continuity of white race consciousness over the course of American history. This section, by contrast, focuses on the partial transformation of the functioning of race consciousness that occurred with the transition from Jim Crow to formal equality in race law. Prior to the civil rights reforms, blacks were formally subordinated by the state. Blacks experienced being the other in two aspects of oppression, which I shall designate as symbolic and material. Symbolic subordination refers to the formal denial of social and political equality to all blacks, regardless of their accomplishments. Segregation and other forms of social exclusion, separate restrooms, drinking fountains, entrances, parks, cemeteries, and dining facilities, reinforced a racist ideology that blacks were simply inferior to whites and were therefore not included in the vision of America as a community of equals. Material subordination, on the other hand, refers to the ways that discrimination and exclusion economically subordinated blacks to whites and subordinated the life chances of blacks to those of whites on almost every level. This subordination occurs when blacks are paid less for the same work, when segregation limits access to decent housing, and where poverty, anxiety, poor health care, and crime create a life expectancy for blacks that is five to six years shorter than for whites. Symbolic subordination often created material disadvantage by reinforcing race consciousness in everything from employment to education. In fact, the two are generally not thought of separately. Separate facilities were usually inferior facilities, and limited job categorization virtually always brought lower pay and harder work. 
Despite the pervasiveness of racism, however, there existed even before the civil rights movement a class of blacks who were educationally, economically, and professionally equal, if not superior, to many whites. And yet these blacks suffered social and political exclusion as well. It is also significant that not all separation resulted in inferior institutions. School segregation, although often presented as the epitome of symbolic and material subordination, did not always result in inferior education. It is not separation per se that made segregation subordinating, but the fact that it was enforced and supported by state power and accompanied by the explicit belief in African-American inferiority. The response to the civil rights movement was the removal of most formal barriers and symbolic manifestations of subordination. Thus, white only notices and other obvious indicators of the societal policy of racial subordination disappeared, at least in the public sphere. The disappearance of these symbols and subordination reflected the acceptance of the rhetoric of formal equality and signaled the demise of the rhetoric of white supremacy as expressing America's normative vision. In other words, it could no longer be said that blacks were not included as equals in the American political vision. Removal of these public manifestations of subordination was a significant gain for all blacks, although some benefited more than others. The eradication of formal barriers meant more to those whose oppression was primarily symbolic than to those who suffered long-lasting material disadvantage. Yet, despite these disparate results, it would be absurd to suggest that no benefits came from these formal reforms, especially in regard to racial policies such as segregation that were partly material but largely symbolic. Thus, to say that the reforms were merely symbolic is to say a great deal. These legal reforms and the formal extension of citizenship were large achievements precisely because much of what characterized black oppression was symbolic and formal. Yet the attainment of formal equality is not the end of the story. Racial hierarchy cannot be cured by the move to facial race neutrality in the laws that structured the economic, political, and social lives of black people. White race consciousness, in a new form, but still virulent, plays an important, perhaps crucial role in the new regime that has legitimated the deteriorating day-to-day -day material conditions of the majority of blacks. The end of Jim Crow has been accompanied by the demise of an explicit ideology of white supremacy. The white norm, however, has not disappeared. It has only been submerged in popular consciousness. It continues in an unspoken form as a statement of the positive social norm, legitimating the continuing domination of those who do not meet it. Nor have the negative stereotypes associated with blacks been eradicated. The rationalizations once used to legitimate black subordination based on a belief in racial inferiority have now been re-employed to legitimate the domination of blacks through reference to an assumed cultural inferiority. Thomas Sowell, for example, suggests that underclass blacks are economically depressed because they have not adopted the values of hard work and discipline. He further implies that blacks have not pursued the need to attain skills and marketable education and have not learned to make sacrifices necessary for success. Instead, Soul charges that blacks view demands for special treatment as a means for achieving what other groups have achieved through hard work and the abandonment of racial politics. Soul applies the same stereotypes to the mass of blacks that white supremacists had applied in the past, but bases these modern stereotypes on notions of culture rather than genetics. Sowell characterizes underclass blacks as victims of self-imposed ignorance, lack of direction, and poor work attitudes. Culture, not race, now accounts for this otherness. Except for vestigial pockets of historical racism, any possible connection between past racial subordination and the present situation has been severed by the formal repudiation of the old race-conscious policies. The same dualities historically used to legitimate racial subordination in the name of genetic inferiority have now been adopted by Sowell as a means for explaining 
the subordinated status of blacks today in terms of cultural inferiority. Moreover, Soul's explanation of the subordinate status of blacks also illustrates the treatment of the now unspoken white stereotypes as the positive social norm. His assertion that the absence of certain attributes accounts for the continued subordination of blacks implies that it is the presence of these attributes that explains the only difference between this argument and the older oppositional dynamic is that whereas the latter explained black subordination through reference to the ideology of white supremacy, the former explains black subordination through reference to an unspoken social norm. That norm, although no longer explicitly white supremacist, remains nonetheless a white norm. As Martha Minow has pointed out, the unstated point of comparison is not neutral, but particular, and not inevitable, but only seemingly so when left unstated. White race consciousness, which includes the modern belief in cultural inferiority, acts to further black subordination by justifying all the forms of unofficial racial discrimination, injury, and neglect that flourish in a society that is only formally dedicated to equality. In more subtle ways, moreover, white race consciousness reinforces and is reinforced by the myth of equal opportunity that explains and justifies broader class hierarchies. Race consciousness also reinforces whites' sense that American society is really meritocratic and thus helps prevent them from questioning the basic legitimacy of the free market, believing both that blacks are inferior and that the economy impartially rewards the superior over the inferior, whites see that most blacks are indeed worse off than whites are, which reinforces their sense that the market is operating fairly and impartially. Those who should logically be on the bottom are on the bottom. This strengthening of whites' belief in the system in turn reinforces their beliefs that blacks are indeed inferior. After all, equal opportunity is the rule, and the market is an impartial judge. If blacks are on the bottom, it must reflect their relative inferiority. Racist ideology thus operates in conjunction with the class components of legal ideology to reinforce the status quo, both in terms of class and race. To bring a fundamental challenge to the way things are, whites would have to question not just their own subordinate status, but also both the economic and the racial myths that justify the status quo. Racism, combined with equal opportunity mythology, provides a rationalization for racial oppression, making it difficult for whites to see the black situation as illegitimate or unnecessary. If whites believe that blacks, because they are unambitious or inferior, get what they deserve, it becomes that much harder to convince whites that something is wrong with the entire system. Similarly, a challenge to the legitimacy of continued racial inequality would force whites to confront myths about equality of opportunity that justify for them whatever measure of economic success they may have attained. Thus, although critics have suggested that legal consciousness plays a central role in legitimating hierarchy in America, the otherness dynamic enthroned within the maintenance and perpetuation of white race consciousness seems to be at least as important as legal consciousness in supporting the dominant order. Like legal consciousness, race consciousness makes it difficult, at least for whites, to imagine the world differently. It also creates the desire for identification with privileged elites. By focusing on a distinct subordinate other, whites can include themselves in the dominant circle, an arena in which most hold no real power, but only their privileged racial identity. Consider the case of a dirt poor, southern white, shown participating in a Ku Klux Klan rally in the movie Resurgence, who declared, Every morning I wake up and thank God I'm white. For this person, and for others like him, race consciousness, manifested by his refusal even to associate with blacks provides a powerful explanation of why he fails to challenge the current social order. Subsection C writes discourse as a challenge to the oppositional dynamic. The oppositional dynamic premised upon maintaining blacks as an excluded and subordinated other initially created an ideological and political structure that 
of formal inequality against which rights rhetoric proved to be the most effective weapon. Although rights rhetoric may ultimately have absorbed the civil rights challenge and legitimated continued subordination, the otherness dynamic provides a fuller understanding of how the very transformation afforded by legal reform itself has contributed to the ideological and political legitimation of continuing black subordination. Rights discourse provided the ideological mechanisms through which the conflicts of federalism, the power of the presidency, and the legitimacy of the courts could be orchestrated against Jim Crow. Movement leaders used these tactics to force open a conflict between whites that eventually benefited black people. Casting racial issues in the moral and legal rights rhetoric of the prevailing ideology helped create the political controversy without which the state's coercive function would not have been enlisted to aid blacks. Simply critiquing the ideology from without or making demands in language outside the rights discourse would have accomplished little. Rather, Blacks gained by using a powerful combination of direct action, mass protest, and individual acts of resistance, along with appeals to public opinion and the courts couched in the language of the prevailing legal consciousness. The result was a series of ideological and political crises. In these crises, civil rights activists and lawyers induced the federal government to aid Blacks and triggered efforts to legitimate and reinforced the authority of the law in ways that benefited blacks. Simply insisting that blacks be integrated or speaking in the language of needs would have endangered the lives of those who were already taking risks and with no reasonable chance of success. President Eisenhower, for example, would not have sent federal troops to Little Rock simply at the behest of protesters demanding that black school children receive an equal education. Instead, the successful manipulation of legal rhetoric led to a crisis of federal power that ultimately benefited blacks. Some critics of legal reform movements seem to overlook the fact that state power has made a significant difference, sometimes between life and death, in the efforts of black people to transform their world. Attempts to harness the power of the state through the appropriate rhetorical legal incantations should be appreciated as intensely powerful and calculated political acts. In the context of white supremacy, engaging in rights discourse should be seen as an act of self-defense. This was particularly true because the state could not assume a position of neutrality regarding black people once the movement had mobilized people to challenge the system of oppression. Either the coercive mechanism of the state had to be used to support white supremacy or it had to be used to dismantle it. We now know with hindsight, that it did both. Blacks did use rights rhetoric to mobilize state power to their benefit against symbolic oppression through formal inequality and, to some extent, against material deprivation in the form of private, informal exclusion of the middle class from jobs and housing. Yet today, the same legal reforms play a role in providing an ideological framework that makes the present conditions facing underclass Blacks appear fair and reasonable. The eradication of barriers has created a new dilemma for those victims of racial oppression who are not in a position to benefit from the move to formal equality. The race neutrality of the legal system creates the illusion that racism is no longer the primary factor responsible for the condition of the black underclass. Instead, as we have seen, class disparities appear to be the consequence of individual and group merit within a supposed system of equal opportunity. Moreover, the fact that there are blacks who are economically successful gives credence both to the assertion that opportunities exist and to the backlash attitude that blacks have gotten too far. Psychologically, for blacks who have not made it, the lack of an explanation for their underclass status may result in self-blame and other self-destructive attitudes. Another consequence of the formal reforms may be the loss of collectivity among Blacks. The removal of former barriers created new opportunities for some Blacks that were not shared by various other classes of African Americans. As Blacks moved into different spheres, the experience of being Black in America became fragmented and multifaceted. 
and the different contexts presented opportunities to experience racism in different ways. The social, economic, even residential distance between the various classes may complicate efforts to unite behind issues as a racial group. Although white-only signs may have been crude and debilitating, they at least presented a readily discernible target around which to organize. Now the targets are obscure and diffuse, and this difference may create doubt among some blacks whether there is enough similarity between their life experiences and those of other blacks to warrant collective political action. Formal equality significantly transformed the black experience in America. With society's embrace of formal equality came the eradication of symbolic domination and the suppression of white supremacy as the norm of society. Future generations of black Americans would no longer be explicitly regarded as America's second-class citizens. Yet, the transformation of the oppositional dynamic achieved through the suppression of racial norms and stereotypes and the recasting of racial inferiority into assumptions of cultural inferiority creates several difficulties for the civil rights constituency. The removal of formal barriers, although symbolically significant to all and materially significant to some, will do little to alter the hierarchical relationship between blacks and whites until the way in which white race consciousness perpetuates norms that legitimate black subordination is revealed. This is not to say that white norms alone account for the conditions of the black underclass. It is instead an acknowledgement that until the distinct racial nature of class ideology is itself revealed and debunked, nothing can be done about the underlying structural problems that account for the disparities. The narrow focus of racial exclusion, that is, the belief that racial exclusion is illegitimate only where the white-only signs are explicit, coupled with strong assumptions about equal opportunity, makes it difficult to move the discussion of racism beyond the societal self-satisfaction engendered by the appearance of neutral norms and formal inclusion. Subsection D, self-consciousness, ideological struggle. Rights have been important. They may have legitimated racial inequality, but they also have been the means by which oppressed groups have secured both entry as formal equals into the dominant order and the survival of their movement in the face of private and state repression. The dual role of legal change creates a dilemma for black reformers. As long as race consciousness thrives, blacks will often have to rely on rights rhetoric when it is necessary to protect black interests. The very reforms brought about by appeals to legal ideology, however, seem to undermine the ability to move forward toward a broader vision of racial equality. In the quest for racial justice, winning and losing have been part of the same experience. The critics are correct in observing that engaging in rights discourse has helped to de-radicalize and co-opt the challenge. Yet they fail to acknowledge the limited range of options presented to blacks in a context where they were deemed other, and the unlikelihood that specific demands for inclusion and equality would be heard if articulated in other terms. This abbreviated list of options is itself contingent upon the ideological power of white race consciousness and the continuing role of black Americans as other. Future efforts to address racial domination as well as class hierarchy must consider the continuing ideology of white race consciousness by uncovering the oppositional dynamic and by chipping away at its premises. Central to this task is revealing the contingency of race and exploring the connection between white race consciousness and other myths that legitimate both class and race hierarchies. Critics and others whose agendas include challenging hierarchy and legitimation must not overlook the importance of revealing the contingency of race. Optimally, the deconstruction of white race consciousness might lead to a liberated future for both blacks and whites. Yet, until whites recognize the hegemonic function of racism and turn their efforts toward neutralizing it, African-American people must develop pragmatic political strategies, self-conscious ideological struggle to minimize the cost of liberal reform while maximizing its utility. A primary step in engaging in self-conscious ideological struggle must be to transcend the oppositional dynamic in which blacks are cast simply and solely 
as White's subordinate other. The dual role that rights have played makes strategizing a difficult task. Black people can afford neither to resign themselves to nor attack frontally the legitimacy and incoherence of the dominant ideology. The subordinate position of blacks in this society makes it unlikely that African Americans will realize gains through the kind of direct challenge to the legitimacy of American liberal ideology that is now being waged by critical scholars. On the other hand, delegitimating race consciousness would be directly relevant to black needs, and this strategy will sometimes require the pragmatic use of liberal ideology. This vision is consistent with the views forwarded by theoreticians such as Francis Fox Piven and Richard Cloward, Antonio Gramsci, and Roberto Unger. Piven and Cloward observe that oppressed people sometimes advance by creating ideological and political crises but that the form of the crisis-producing challenge must reflect the institutional logic of the system. The use of rights rhetoric during the civil rights movement created such a crisis by presenting and manipulating the dominant ideology in a new and transformative way. Challenges and demands made from outside the institutional logic would have accomplished little because blacks, as the subordinate other, were already perceived as being outside the mainstream. The struggle of blacks like that of all subordinated groups, is a struggle for inclusion, an attempt to manipulate elements of the dominant ideology to transform the experience of domination. It is a struggle to create a new status quo through the ideological and political tools that are available. Gramsci called this struggle a war of position, and he regarded it as the most appropriate strategy for change in Western societies. According to Gramsci, Direct challenges to the dominant class accomplish little if ideology plays such a central role in establishing authority that the legitimacy of the dominant regime is not challenged. Joseph Femia, interpreting Gramsci, states that the dominant ideology in modern capitalist societies is highly institutionalized and widely internalized. It follows that a concentration on frontal attack, on direct assault against the bourgeois state, War of movement or war of maneuver can result only in disappointment and defeat. Consequently, the challenge in such societies is to create a counter hegemony by maneuvering within and expanding the dominant ideology to embrace the potential for change. Gramsci's vision of ideological struggle is echoed in part by Roberto Unger in his vision of deviationist doctrine. Unger who represents a discarding liberal legal ideology, we should focus and develop its visionary undercurrents. The struggle over the form of social life through deviationist doctrine creates opportunities for experimental revisions of social life in the direction of the ideals we defend. An implication of our ideas is that the elements of a formative institutional or imaginative structure may be replaced piecemeal rather than only all at once. Liberal ideology embraces communal and liberating visions along with the legitimating hegemonic visions. Unger, like Gramsci and Piven and Cloward, seems to suggest that the strategy towards meaningful change depends on skillful use of the liberating potential of dominant ideology. Section 5, Conclusion For Blacks, The task at hand is to devise ways to wage ideological and political struggle while minimizing the cost of engaging in an inherently legitimating discourse. A clearer understanding of the space we occupy in the American political consciousness is a necessary prerequisite to the development of pragmatic strategies for political and economic survival. In this regard, the most serious challenge for blacks is to minimize the political and cultural cost of engaging in an inevitably co-optive process in order to secure material benefits. Because our present predicament gives us few options, we must create conditions for the maintenance of a distinct political thought that is informed by the actual conditions of black people. Unlike the civil rights vision, this new approach should not be defined and therefore limited by the possibilities of dominant political discourse, but should maintain a distinctly progressive outlook 
that focuses on the needs of the African-American community. The end.